From Cedarburg Public Library Radio. We are in what I call the second of the modern day globalizations. The last one ended with the Great Depression. Uh, this one is, is uh, looking a little bit vulnerable. And there are lots of people who are come, opining one way or another in terms of where it's going. We're particularly lucky to have not only an economist, not only a world traveler, a snappy dresser and all around good egg, Peter Cranstover available, uh, to lead us through a discussion on this. And, and obviously at the end, we wanna bring it not only out in, in the international dimensions, but how it affects us in our own community. So Peter, thank you very much for agreeing to do this and take it away. Great, John, thanks so much. Always uh, always good to be here and, and happy to contribute a bit once again to these interesting themes from the Foreign Policy Association. So I, John uh, mentioned an interesting thing in his introduction about us being in a second globalization. And I would agree, uh, I would agree with that. Uh, the first one being from about the mid 1800s up until the the Great Depression, that was sort of a golden age of, of trade uh, and globalization. But to that, I, I thought it might be useful to focus in on two things relatively quickly, um, because this can get deadly, you know, and I don't want to put anybody to sleep here, but, um, to, but to go over a couple of definitions and then maybe get into a little bit of theory. We talk about globalization, you know, and it's interchangeable with respect to globalization and communication and transportation, travel, you know, and, and all of these things that have happened really at warp speed just in the past 30 to 40 years. It's really sort of gone up in, in what, you know, accumulatively causation sort of manner, as, as Gunnar Myrdal, the Swedish economist used to say, once you start, you know, you sort of build on everything and it gets faster and faster and faster. And that's what we've seen, certainly since the 80s, when things have really taken off. But I, I want to, I'll talk about globalization, really in terms of economic issues, and in trade, and because that's, I think, at least, um, in a uh, in a policy sense is probably what affects us and what uh, most regularly and certainly what had a lot to do with um, the past uh, couple of elections, certainly the 2016 election, when we saw some of the uh, effects of globalization and indeed when when um, the former President Trump, you know, quite successfully, I think, exploited um, not unreasonably, you know, from a tactical standpoint, some of those particular effects. But just to get through the definition quickly, so uh, it's a process of increasing interconnection, it's faster and cheaper communications, increased speed of travel, all of these things uh, involving a rapidity with which ideas and information and news spreads. And then, of course, the big thing of international trade in goods and services being a, a very large part of this. Now, people always say, well, how do you measure globalization? And I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure, but the Swiss, or at least the Swiss Economic Institute seems to know how. And I'm, I'm not gonna go through that particular unbelievable graphic or two or, or hundreds that they have regarding forecasts and indicators. And they'll tell you how globalized Guatemala is compared to South Africa or how much China is with respect to um, the, the United States. But there's their uh, particular link. If you're interested, it's sort of a fun kind of, uh, website to get on to just to, and it'll show you growth of interconnectedness and trade and things like this amongst countries and around the world, certainly over the past 40 to 50 years. Uh, so what's the basis and the premise, the historical sort of stuff that we're all concerned with here? 
it, it's it's coming about, you know, through all of these major milestones just in the past three to four hundred years. The Peace of Westphalia, which provided countries with a, a, a legal framework around which they could at least be relatively secure in in their within their borders. This brought to an end the Thirty Years' War. Um, you know, essentially between Protestants and Catholics and the, you know, the Habsburgs and the Protestants in, in Europe. Then you have the French and American revolutions in the late 70s and the rights of man. And, and based on these theories, of course, by Rousseau and Voltaire and David Hume and, and uh, Locke and uh, Thomas Hobbes, you know, regarding the importance of a contract with the state as well as an ability to exercise your free will. Well, from this presins these guys, the, the, the Brits, right? The Scotsmen, Adam Smith and Ricardo and Malthus, all of whom built on each other's theories and came in that particular order. And by the way, we didn't call them economists. We call, they were known as social philosophers. It wasn't until the late 1800s that Alfred Marshall, in, in, who started the <clears throat> classical economic theory stuff, started to talk about economics. John Stuart Mill, who was a famous uh, libertarian liberal philosopher in the mid and, and late 1800s built on a lot of this stuff and started to refine things started, such as what Ricardo had originally called comparative advantage. Smith's Wealth of Nations beforehand meant specialization in terms of the Industrial Revolution and how things were produced. And he saw, therefore, trade and commerce as a positive sum game, not as a zero sum game, not as a transactional type of arrangement whereby commerce, you know, is an exploitative thing, although it certainly could be. Ricardo took some of Smith's stuff and, and refined it a bit. Mill, as I say, took it further and, and started to talk about comparative advantage. And what he meant was what a uh, one entity or country can do in terms of its inputs of labor, land, and capital versus what another country can do with uh, labor, land, and capital. And the one that can produce at the margin in the most efficient way with the same inputs is the one that has a comparative advantage. You know, comparative advantage is something you even hear when you're watching the Bucks or the Packers. You know, the announcers say, well, it, you know, uh, Roger's comparative advantage is that he can see the whole field. Well, no, it's probably the fact that the guy's really good. He's got like absolute advantage. You know, it's not really comparative advantage. You know, Rogers is just, a, he's a monster, sort of like Brady, right? Okay. So, but it's become, you know, a, a term that we toss off a lot of, but it's, it, it means this ability to be the most productive in what you do and then get it to the, a particular customer also on time. All right. So this led to then this business of, and that's what it was, this great divergence. And I, I trust you can see this one, but uh, it led to, in about the 1840s, to, as John said earlier, the beginning of the Great Depression, this huge impact regarding world growth, uh, world uh, gross uh, domestic product. And you can see about right down here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here you've got approximately um, the 18, you've got the, uh, you've got about the 1840s, 1820s of about a, a, a world GDP of 1.2 trillion. Well, by the time we get up to here, 2018, 2017, 2015, you're talking about $101 trillion in wealth being generated amongst the world economies, all of which happens to be reflective of these changes that have happened over the past 150 to, to 170 years, really. And all because of these theories and this philosophy and these types of ideas that Smith and Ricardo and Malthus and Mill, and then the, what they call the classical economists like Marshall, who was at Cambridge and, and eventually leading to Keynes and guys like this, developed and talked about and were then manifested in a lot of economic policies. Tariffs came down, people were able to move about, financing became available. And indeed, 
things such as economic inequality, particularly by, by David Ricardo, were talked about during this time because he was concerned that some people would get a little bit too rich and, some, and others wouldn't. And that might be problematic in terms of a, a country's liberal democratic uh, progress. So this great divergence that I'm talking about, as you saw just in that last uh, slide, <laughs> really starts then because of the kinds of policies that the big economies at the time, certainly as the US was just starting to grow, but more so in, in, in England and in Great Britain, uh, began to uh, implement and, and began to enjoy. They tweaked building a better economic global structure, which comes out much more in post-World War II uh, policy directives. And you also have the developing countries later on, particularly after World War II, talking about the fact that they don't necessarily want to participate in this open, transparent, classical kind of trading regime and economic capitalist type of uh, arrangement in order to get rich. They're saying, we have a different system. We have different factor proportions. We know how to develop. And you guys in the West certainly aren't going to tell us how to do it. And it was championed by two guys who won the Nobel Prize in, in economics in the 70s. One was a, 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 a British fellow by the name of Arthur Lewis, actually from St. Lucia, a little island in the Caribbean. And Vasily Leontiev, who was sort of a champion of central planning for the Soviets, interestingly enough and who became quite a, um, um, a champion of the third world, of third world planning economies and economics. <clears throat> and then, you know, all of a sudden we jump to the trade and globalization uh, or the trade uh, talks after World War II in the GATT, the, uh, the uh, general agreement on trades and tariffs, which eventually becomes the uh, World Trade Organization in 1993, 1993 to 1995, they had these negotiations with the intent that everybody's going to come together. Everybody's going to do well. Everybody is going to be able to benefit from a much more open and transparent and free market kind of arrangement of economic growth and trade. Needless to say, and we'll come back to this later, perhaps in the discussion, we get 9-11, we get a financial crisis in, in 27 and, and, and 2008. And in the Doha round of the last time we actually got together as a world in terms of, of trade negotiations, Doha and Qatar in 06, everything sort of just collapses because countries started to get at, and the agenda was, let's talk about agricultural subsidies in various countries. And the US and France and, and any other number, the Russians, you know, the Argentinians who grow a lot of wheat, the Australians who do the same thing. They didn't want to talk about leaving those particular sectors unprotected. They didn't want to allow tariffs to go down and thereby jeopardize the production and the distribution of, of their ag sector. Now, when you think about that from a strategic or security standpoint, you think, eh, yeah, probably not a bad thing. We do it here for sugar beets. We do it here for sugar cane. We do it here for milk and cheese and things like this. So it's one of these things that's kind of that third rail, for lack of a better term, really in trade negotiations that just couldn't be, um, that couldn't be resolved. And so those talks regarding further trade in 06 and Doha were essentially the last time that the world got together in terms of pushing this globalization agenda, uh, agenda regarding trade um, uh, and, uh, to, to deal with. And, and that was the last time that, that anything happened in that regard. So here are just a couple of things further to this, a, a bit of theory, comparative advantage, which I'll just leave for your, for your quick perusal here. <coughs> And this third point here regarding comparative advantage is that it gives residents of a country with higher cost of producing additional units of a good an incentive to trade with a nation that has a comparative advantage, right? I.e., right? We're dealing with the Chinese. We imported Ch uh, Japanese cars in the 60s and the 70s, all, of because, all because our cost of producing additional units of a particular good were higher than theirs, all right? At the margin, all right? <clears throat> 
And residents, and here's the consumer argument about this, of a country with higher opportunity costs. And opportunity cost is just a cost that you forego by choosing to do something else, okay? So consumers through trade can get more units of a good or service at a lower cost than the domestic cost of producing that good or service, all right? It's sort of like if, um, you, you know, you, you don't want to sit there with a, a shovel and hoe doing wheat all the time when your neighbor, you know, is doing it with a combine, right? You could probably be doing something else, like maybe chopping wood or hauling water or sewing clothes or something like that while they produce wheat for you, okay? And that and your opportunity cost is giving up the shovel and the, and the hole, which you should be happy to do, and, and buying that stuff by trading your goods that you're making there in your house. So this leads to specialization and trade arising from both absolute and comparative advantage. And this varies over time, you know, and it varies over time because of population growth, because of communications, because of the availability of financing, because of the inputs that you might be putting into your process. Are they, are, are they renewable inputs? Are they fixed? Are you able to access them, right? And so as a result, this, this last point on this theory, nations can develop or lose absolute and comparative advantages over time. And, you're, and here's the thing for the country, the domestic income redistributions, because of this trade going back and forth, can thereby take place, right? So here's, here's what we're seeing with respect to the US becoming much more integrated into the international economy over the past 40 years. We see domestic income redistributions taking place, right? Your, your, your middle class, your working class, your blue collar guys having a tough time and having their wages for in a, in a uh, certainly in an absolute and, and relative sense diminishing, right? So, just to just to recap a little bit, just the hit. So late 1800s of World War One, and the advancements in transportation spurring large increases in trade to GDP, and then World War One and the start of the Great Depression. And because of a an an off kilter sense of security and nationalism, you know, Senator Senator Smoot and, and, and Representative Willis Hawley. Hawley was from Washington State, you know, which has a lot of wheat and agricultural products and stuff. And Smoot was from uh, Utah, get together and pass the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act in 1930. This is the last time, by the way, that the legislature, U.S. legislature actually got involved in putting tariffs up. It's all been by executive action since then. Tr tariffs raised to as high as 60% and it exacerbated economic, the diminishment of economic growth here in the States, if not, if not around the world. Post-World War II, we're looking at something that actually Churchill and Roosevelt, prescient as they were, anticipated a little bit. In 1941, August of 1941, they're in Newfoundland, they're, they, they meet in the harbor in Newfoundland in order to talk about, this is in 41, even though we're not in the war yet officially, although at this time Roosevelt had already given 50 mothball destroyers to Churchill under Lemley's, you know, and, and so it, you know, we were providing certainly the, the allies with some of this stuff, but they talked about what was going to happen after the war. And they started to talk about things such as a, and this was not their term, but uh, uh, a new liberal world order, right? <clears throat> and a, an institutional international structure that would facilitate trade, promote employment, sustainable economic growth, and basically help to reduce poverty, right? Reduce global poverty, not a good thing to have, right? This results in not only the IMF being formed in 44, which is meant to produce international financial stability and monetary cooperation, but it also begins, provides the basis for it, some of the structure for uh, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, what we know as the World Bank, right? <clears throat> Ultimately being formed at Bretton Woods in, in Washington. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, in uh, New Hampshire, an old old lodge up there in New Hampshire in the woods. And of course, that helped very much both the IMF and the World <laughs> Bank to rebuild Europe, rebuild countries devastated by World War II, and was heavy, heavy, heavy uh, in its focus regarding infrastructure on capital investment on dams, electrical irrigation systems and roads. And then they get the International Finance Corporation in there because the International Finance Corporation is small or, or a loan window at concessional rates <clears throat> was needed in order to give some capital, uh, some liquidity to, to countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America. And then of course the WTO, <clears throat> which replaces the gap, the general agreement on trades and tariffs. And as I say, basically hits a wall in Doha in 2006. Nonetheless, it functions still as a global arbiter of trade rules and enforcement. It's a forum for multinational negotiations and trade. It can fine, we've been fined, and the other countries have been fined because of unfair trade practices. <clears throat> Things such as Mexican tomatoes into Southern California, you know, went before the WTO, which was a reflection of NAFTA, of the NAFTA agreement being signed in in, uh, in the early 90s and, uh, and ultimately being renegotiated in the Trump administration, now, now called the USMCA. But it provides a forum whereby trade issues fairness, dumping, what they call it. dumping is trading, basically a product that uh, by one country that happens to be um, priced at a cost that is less than its cost of production, thereby undermining the, the its trading partner's market. It's against the law. And if the WTO happens to find that a nation that brings a case before them is actually in the right, that nation can then charge a countervailing duty. Well, this sort of went out the window during the Trump administration because the appellate group that uh, we have a number of judges on and that each administration um, nominates to serve as on that was essentially moribund and no judges, there were four of them, I think that Trump was able to uh, um, put in, but he didn't. And so th this, particular function in any case is WTO atrophied, certainly during his administration. Now, <clears throat> there's no denying the tremendous amount of good that greater trade has done over the years. And indeed, going back to this one here, we didn't see this one really, but here's a, just a projected GDP from Barclays and Goldman Sachs from 2000 to, and a projection out to 2050, assuming that all things stay the same, right? <laughs> we don't, that God forbid, you know, there's there's a, a war or something, and then um, nations just decide not to talk to each other anymore. But this is reflective of what economists would anticipate is going to happen regarding economic growth regarding gross domestic product, the measure of all goods and services that a nation happens to put out every year. And uh, this happens to be the result of the kinds of things reflective of a fully integrated, globalized economy from your economic and communications and transportation structures to also your financial flows. This is what Barclays happens to believe that India, the US, China and continental Europe, just to pick a few, right? What will look like. And you can see China in the red here, sort of going up almost at a 45 degree angle. The US having certainly some pretty strong growth. Uh, India kind of kind of catching its, uh, catching a second wind here around 2030. Tremendous amount of course of, of technological know-how really fine engineering schools and stuff in, in, in India. And to say nothing of the fact that, you know, you've got, as in China, you know, this almost surplus labor force, you know, that's just, um, that Rick talked about a little bit, uh, you know, two weeks ago regarding uh, China's manufacturing sector. So 
but this wouldn't happen, but that these institutions and laws and communications amongst or that and uh, that are characteristic of this globalized world weren't in place. And so what was it that went wrong, if anything? Well, <clears throat> as I hinted at a little while ago, huge income disparities. Remember, we were talking about theory here with Smith and Ricardo and Malthus and Mill, <clears throat> and then into the 20th century. And trade was oftentimes taken and served as a rationale for good international relations. If we have good international relations, we'll have good trade. And if we have good trade, we're not going to have conflict, right? Well, it's not a bad theory. And indeed, you know, it, 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 there, it, there's a certain reasonableness to it. But what it didn't take into account were things such as the hollowing out of certain sectors in both manufacturing and agriculture, not only here in, in the United States, but in developed countries around the world, and in certainly in developing countries around the world. It, it hurt Argentina, which doesn't have a, a very much, and it hurt Asia in the mid-90s because they didn't have a particularly well-articulated economic structure, certainly in terms of financing. And so if you're asking those countries to all of a sudden knock down their trade barriers and engage in <clears throat> a structure based on a textbook theory regarding the benefits to be obtained by free trade without the sort of buffers and regulations and policy considerations that you need to wrap around those things without taking into account what's going to happen to your small farmers, for instance, or without taking into account what's going to happen to your, uh, to your, to your steel workers, for instance, or without taking into account what's going to happen to your, um, uh, your, your labor force, whether that's going to be able to move, whether you've got some training <laughs> programs in place, whether you can um, essentially take this, what's a, what's a hit to the structure of your society, you're going to have trouble. And that's what we've seen here in the U.S. Now, the Reagan administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration into the Obama administration have all embraced this stuff. And why not? Our growth has been tremendous, but because of everything from outdated technology, and I would submit it's technology for the most part, as well as our outdated tax structure, as well as our educational uh, sector, we've really taken a hit here. And we've, the people who have gotten hit here have been the ones who have not had a, uh, who, have, who, who are high school graduates, who are somewhat stationary, who don't have a, 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 an ability to move about, right? To go someplace, to basically follow the money or to go, and, and serve and, and work in, in some other place, if not indeed another country. And <clears throat> it hasn't been buffered by commensurate social policies from Washington, if not from the states, in order to take care of that particular sector of society, which understandably gets pretty annoyed, right? Gets and starts to think about globalization as a reflection of some larger type of structure that they don't really have any, any particular um, uh, power to, to uh, over or indeed any ability to influence because it, it's the consumer ultimately who's benefiting in large part from this and that, that consumer who happens to have money we're able to pick up, you know, T-shirts, you know, for a couple of bucks because three people in Dhaka from a family are working in a T-shirt factory for a month and they make $410 amongst them, right? And the same thing with, um, with tools and with um, <clears throat> any other kind of particular merchandise that you want to manage, that you want to uh, 
that you want to mention. But it's that welfare argument that policymakers use oftentimes that very much seems to save the day. Saves the day in the sense that let's leave this trade structure alone. Now, Trump came in and he put tariffs up. He didn't do it through the WTO and it was ham handed and it annoyed a hell of a lot of people. Interestingly enough, Biden hasn't knocked those back. He's kept those for a while. He could have wiped those out with some executive orders when he came in, but he decided to leave them in place. So I say, oh, well, okay. Now, it's made those products in, in the steel industry and aluminum a, a, certainly a little bit higher internally here, right? Or for anybody else for that matter. <clears throat> but it's maintained some jobs, uh, not, in a, not in a great way, but certainly in, in those traditional industries. And from a policy standpoint, from a political standpoint, that's not one could argue that's not a bad thing. Nonetheless, I would submit it can't, it can't maintain. And a couple of guys, certainly who write about this stuff, like Joseph Nye, who's been, was served in the, um, I think he served in the Clinton administration for a while, but a Mr. political Soft scientist Power. at Harvard. Sorry? Mr. Soft Power. Mr. Soft Power, exactly. Is saying that policy elites who want to support globalization, policy elites, right? You're talking Washington here and in London. And an open economy need to pay more attention to economic inequality. And he talks about this in a foreign affairs <clears throat> article of, uh, of January 2017. And you need to pay more attention to economic inequality, those disrupted by change, right? And you need to stimulate broad-based economic growth at the same time, okay? But, but Peter, don't you think there's an inherent contradiction here between Ricardo's comparative advantage and the nation state, which has to protect its own its own? Yes, yeah, right. And and so what if you're going to have this open type of society in terms of your financial sector, in terms of your trade sector, you're going to you're going to have to uh, you can probably be assured that theory will allow economic growth to to um, to maintain if not to if not to to do quite well but you have to pay attention to the implications of that on the people who happen to be in those particular sectors that are going to be hurt when nafta was being negotiated with the mexicans and the canadians the mexicans were always saying well you know we've and by the way nafta was put into place in part because there was a concern certainly in the 90s just as there has been over decades about immigration from mexico now, most of the immigration happens to be from Central America. But at that time, the Mexicans were saying, and the U.S. was saying, if we can negotiate a trade arrangement whereby the, the sector in your country or mine that happens to have the greatest comparative advantage, you know, for doing things can prevail here, you know, then what will, then better jobs will be created on both sides of the border and this whole immigration business will be dampened down. Well, in part, that prevailed. And indeed, Canada and the U.S. and Mexico all have benefited more than been damaged by, by NAFTA and now USMCA. What happened was, though, you had such a large group of, of small-scale farmers in Mexico because of that open trade, the tomato farmers, your bean farmers, your coffee guys, right, who don't have necessarily have great big uh, farms, being hurt by the exposure to more competitive producers of, in this case, beans and tomatoes. Not we don't do coffee, but we do do beans and, and, and tomatoes, for instance. You know, and the and the and the uh, uh, farmers certainly in the Southwest and throughout the United States were were pretty much able, you know, to 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 uh, function here. One reason why the tomatoes not to dwell on tomatoes from Mexico too much, but didn't come in right away under this is because the, the California tomato growers are saying, we're not taking those tomatoes. We don't care if you've got a NAFTA agreement here. And it went and it, and it languished for 10 to 15 years. And I, I can't remember all the details, but it's essentially been resolved. Mexicans can now move tomatoes in the United States, but probably not as many as they had anticipated. The, all of that to say, John, yeah. So, it, it just it's a, yet another case of saying, oh, the policymaker saying, but look, my data indicate that this will be great for our economy. Okay? And as a statement, that's probably true. Right. 
but it's not fully accurate. It doesn't necessarily indicate or reflect the kinds of externalities or the unintended consequences that this greater indication, uh, uh, integration you know, happens, to, happens to mean. When Kennedy formed the, 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 uh, the USTR group, it's right near the White House, it's a relatively small office, it's a sub-cabinet position, and this guy Rob Portman, who used to be a senator from Ohio, ran it during the uh, Trump administration, <clears throat> was formed in 1961. The rationale for that was, among other things, to maintain, to help us with respect to national security, right? USTR, U.S. Trade Representative, we need to have this integrated, globalized economy because it'll help us, among other things, to have a greater economy, but it's also good for national security. If you're making money, you're not going to be shooting at each other. I had an Israeli friend, you know, when in the 90s down in Costa Rica who was working with the U.N., and we were talking and he had some Palestinian friends, and, you know, at that time, Arafat and Rabin were talking and eventually signed this agreement, you know, <clears throat> Camp David Accords, or not Camp David Accords, but the Oslo Accords in Washington. And he said, yeah, we're all talking, I'm talking to my Palestinian friends about this agreement. I said, that's great. He said, yeah, he said, business will be good. <laughs> I thought, yeah, okay, this is this will be a good thing to have, right? Well, Peter, some, some suggest that the prevailing a strategy of the United States post World War II was stability, because it generated trade. Yes, yes, and uh, all of a sudden, it it just so happened that we were able to bring in a lot of different products from the third world for our manufacturing processes because we were certainly at the top of the heap at that time, our manufacturing processes and industrial sector hadn't been destroyed, right? And so what we did was bring in a lot of different, um, what they call primary products in order, to, um, in order to maintain our manufacturing sector and talk about stability, right? 50s and 60s, it was just chugging along in this secular line, you know, of great economic growth. This is where this guy, Lewis and Leontiev come in though. They're at the UN and they're saying, this is all wonderful, but by the way, you're taking these primary products from us in this trade system, and that's all well and good. We get a little money there, but primary products don't generate the kind of revenue and the kind of spinoffs in terms of linkages that manufactured goods do. That's why exports are pushed as an engine of growth in so many countries, because they have lots of value added, as the economists say, right? They have, if you're putting together a widget, the widget requires all kinds of things, and maybe even nowadays some rare earth minerals or something like this. But primary products, wheat and lumber and coal and, and, and titanium and all of these things, potash, you know, guano, which is what W.R. Grace made their money off of in the late 1800s. And then and and uh, and DuPont, too, you know, the great munitions manufacturer starting out, DuPont started out with, you know, making gunpowder, took that stuff and manufactured something from it. And every time it went through a particular processing step, it became more valuable because it reflected the value of the process that it was going through and the labor that was put into it. Leontief and Lewis said, hold the phone, you know, we're going to maintain, we would submit that we protect our particular economies behind big tariff walls. And they did. Third world did for the most part, 50s and 60s, 70s for the most part, too. And then they started in the 80s to push these things down because of negotiations, as well as the fact that they realized that they were terribly inefficient. But it was disruptive. It was disruptive. And, and places change. And... Um, Certainly when you have a, a small grouping of, uh, of, of an elite, you know, in, 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 a, in a small third world country or even a large third world country that happens to hold the reins of power and, and, and has finance and, and political power behind it, you're going to have some problems, you know, with the over, uh, overall um, grouping, you know, or sectors of your society that aren't benefiting from that. And they're not benefiting from it because your institutions aren't there. You don't have decent tax institutions. You don't have decent regulatory institutions. You don't have decent infrastructure. So you need all of that stuff in order to reap those full benefits of trade. Right? 
I think that was an answer to your question, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also seems, Peter, <clears throat> that <clears throat> when when these were colonies, there weren't the same kinds of issues. It's when they became nation states that these issues arose. I think that's true. I think that's true. You know, and and then all of a sudden they had to, you know, they, they were they they were told to well. They were told, you know, okay, it's post World War II. Um, we don't want to have these conflicts anymore. By the way, they're, you know, from Bretton Woods and from the Dunbar and Oaks agreements and stuff like this. Uh, we now have these institutions. Let's get on. Uh, uh, let's get on board and and let's and and let's talk to each other. The UN. I haven't even mentioned the UN. The UN is formed as a part of this whole business too. This, the Atlantic Charter actually had some verbiage in it that was used then for the. Uh, Ultimately, the, the UN Charter, which was done in 1944, but <clears throat> the whole issue there was to prevent any further conflict. But you know, the vast majority of the world, in terms of its e economic and financial uh, integration, just wasn't there yet. So uh, a lot of them just said, "Hold the phone," and threw up these big walls of, of tariffs. Um, and decided really not to play ball for a long, long time until, as I say, the 80s and the 90s and, and then uh, and into the 2000s. Um, just a couple other. So I just want to make, so Nye talks about this. You know, he's Mr. Soft Power, as John said. And you also have a guy named Michael Mandelbaum. Who's, I, I'm not sure if he's around anymore. He used to be at Johns Hopkins, but he's got a book called The Case for Goliath, which talks about the importance of the United States to the world. And the fact that everybody sort of gets a free ride on the United States. If we're concerned about governance and security and economics, if not defense, right, as the big dog for our own security and stuff, nobody else will. And as long as we are, the rest of the world is quite happy. They might be annoyed with our behavior, but they find it tolerable and for the most part is convenient, right? So Mandelbaum is basically saying so. Let's not, you know, let's, let's, that's the case for Goliath. I'm not, never quite sure whether he's, he's really, he, you know, saying that he believes this stuff, but he is saying he's crafting this argument whereby he says, this is why you need somebody who's basically going to um, take it upon, take it upon his, his own nation to, to make sure things run well. And we're arrogant enough to do it, of course, right? The exceptional nation and all of that stuff, right? Pride before the fall, right? <laughs> Washington's role in helping to stabilize the world and underwrite its progress may be even more important now than ever. Nye says, okay, don't panic, he's saying. Don't pull back at this point, all right? Uh, just a few more. Yeah, Mandelbaum says, too, that China benefits from the existing international order more than it acknowledges. And... Nye says, I think that, you know, don't get, don't be afraid of China. China's, uh, uh, let's engage with them. But, you know, if, if you disaggregate all of the data there, then it's overall, a, you know, a rather poor country with a, a, a lot of people certainly still in the rural sector. And it doesn't, it, we, we shouldn't have an inordinately, um, uh, in sort of um, untoward reaction towards their positions on things. I thought this, if you saw this exchange between the Chinese and our guys at, in uh, this, just this past week, um, Secretary of State Blinken, it was a pretty raw exchange, finger pointing kind of, yeah, but you guys are doing this. I sort of thought that was a rather productive exchange, <laughs> even though it, it got to the point where they were almost insulting. <laughs> frank, frank and comradely comments. Yeah, yes, right. Better that we're talking. Uh, governments possess the power and resources, but the stage is getting crowded. I don't think that comes as any. These are just some observations from various publications that I've been looking at. International financial stability is vital to all and requires cooperation. This one, in a world with porous borders, nations need to use soft power more. Washington can provide some public goods by itself. A public good is one that everybody benefits from and that the private market, the capitalist market will not do on its own because it doesn't make economic sense, right? Like defense, that's the big one, but not for long. Um, 
And even if economic globalization slows, technology is creating this ecological, political, and social, all ecological meaning ecological, political and social connections, right? Amongst people, amongst nations. And it requires continued cooperative responses. And then there's this thing about, and I tried to illustrate that with my anecdote about my Israeli friend talking to his Palestinian friends, that trade and engagement stops bad behavior. People, if, if, you're, if you're making, as Molly Ivins used to say, the Texas columnist, right? If you're making good business, right? It'll be okay. But Peter, that also depends upon what direction your government is. If, if in, as in Russia, where politics uh, trumps economics, then that particular comment doesn't hold as much water. Yes. I think that there's something that I think that, you know, th this um, the line of, of uh, or, or, or the idea that um, uh, the, the politics of resentment is really what drives things, that we're all subjective voters ha may have something to to uh, maybe useful in explaining nation's behavior, too, even if you happen to have by engaging with somebody you don't like or somebody you haven't been traditionally allied with, even if you have something to gain by, by that, you may not want to do that. You may prefer to just give yourself a sharp stick in the eye simply because of the kind of history that you may have had with them or because of the fact that, that you just don't, you know, you, you've always disliked them. You never want to deal with them. You happen to be, uh, you, you've been on the wrong side of history, you know, for the past thousand years and you're not interested, right? And I, I think... <laughs> I, you know, that 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 may there, there may be a psychological explanation, uh, you know, for for that for that lack of cooperation. I mean, there you go again with economic theory. Right. Let, let's let's do this and everything will be better. Smith and Ricardo and Mill and uh, Keynes are saying, right, this is I've used this in the past. And let me just see uh, uh, that. And, and this is just. These are just sort of things to keep you up at night <laughs> that, you know, this is from this. This is from the analysts from the intel agencies that, that put this stuff out. The director of national intelligence and the National Intelligence Council brings all of this stuff together every every couple of years about sort of your big picture kind of trends that uh, we all should be aware of. And, and it's just a it's just a little bit of a checklist regarding the fact that the rich are aging and the poor are not. Global economy is shifting. Weak economic growth is gonna persist in the near term. Technology is accelerating progress, but causing discontinuities. I'm not entirely sure what discontinuities means, but I think it might mean that you couldn't graph it, you know, on a nice neat straight line that goes up or down. Ideas and identities are driving a wave of exclusion. You see this, you know, certainly you see it in the Middle East with Yemen and the Saudis. You see it in, 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 uh, in Myanmar now. You certainly see it in, in, uh, throughout Africa. Uh, you, you, even, you see it in some places in Latin America, certainly. Governing is getting harder because of a whole bunch of things. The nature of conflict is changing. Now you got immigration, you got drugs, right? You have non-state actors who are doing trading in, in, in certainly not traditional sorts of manufactured goods and things like this. And then you've got climate change, the environment and health issues. And we don't have to, we all know about health issues certainly over this past year. So to conclude, I would say, I would lean towards the fact that you're not going to be able to put globalization back in some corner, right? It's part of a human desire to remain connected, to progress, to have better things, right? That requires a regular framework and uh, constant communication amongst all of the players, right? With, without necessarily serving as, and this is where I think we've, I would hope the U.S. has learned its lesson a bit, if, if, without appearing to be too aggressive or overbearing or directive in terms of our positions and things. And that 
the kinds of consumer welfare benefits that this has brought everybody, certainly in the developed world, right? If not, if not the developing world, uh, are such that they are they're they're going to be fiercely maintained by the people who happen to have benefited from them. Everything you know from from cars to brooms to t-shirts to things like this that we had to lower food prices for goodness sake that we happen to that we happen to to benefit from the question for me or the the issue for me is having a number of institutions that can maintain a hand in in keeping this particular system that really blossomed after world war II in in what's sometimes called the the liberal the international liberal economic order <clears throat> and maintain it in such a way as to be able to um, spread its benefits uh, around the world and to and to maintain the institutions that allow us to such as the UN and the WTO and places like this that allow us these that provide these forums whereby we can continue to communicate. Lastly, I'll just say, uh, Jeff, I. I do this sometimes just to, well, I'll ha you'll have this now, but when I taught at the business school for a little bit at Marquette, uh, I used Michael Sandel's book, which talks about what's so great about markets, basically, you know, markets do good things, but yeah, they also really hurt people, you know, and why do we have to have markets for everything from standing in line, you know, to making ice cream and stuff like this. He's got a blog uh, piece also. That he, that he writes on period. Global Paradox, Danny Roderick has been an economist at the World Bank for a long time. And he says, you, you need to take care of the people who aren't part of that globalization process. And then Mariana Masucato is an Italian uh, American economist who's got a number of pieces, one of which is the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial state where she says, the, the free market doesn't necessarily generate great things out of whole cloth. The state, provides, and this is particularly true, you know, for things that have spun off from the defense industries, but the internet for that matter, the World Wide Web, the state's investments in, uh, in the space program, there's another good example, is such that they have provided, because they've been able to carry the costs, all kinds of different uh, elements and products that have eventually come into the, uh, into the um, capitalist uh, marketplace. Making globalization work is by Stiglitz, who used to be at the World Bank, also won the Nobel Prize. And then the other one, I mentioned the case for Goliath, which is which is Mandelbaum. Um, I, I would say, too, that, you know, it's interesting just driving around Ozaki County uh, sometimes, not only because it's just a nice, nice place to be, but, you know, you'll see Wheelow, Wheelow pumps from, from Dortmund, Germany, Building their, their worldwide headquarters are here on 60, now near five corners. They have something like 60,000 employees. They're, they're an, an indicator, you know, of, of a real product of globalization. You've got Cronin Cranes in Watertown, which is a Finnish company. They've got something like 600 places around the world. And they do, they, they employ about 100 guys over there in Watertown making a particular widget or two for, for the cranes. You've got Komatsu down here in Milwaukee, which bought out uh, Pauli and Harnischweger, p &H, you know, the big heavy mining and um, um, earth moving operation, you know, the cranes that they built beginning in Milwaukee in the late 1800s. And all of these things are reflective of this type of um, to use one economist term, this sort of creative destruction, whereby, you know, you, you get these winners and losers count going up and down and all of a sudden coming out, you know, in a much more concentrated, if slightly more streamlined way, right? Which again, has some winners and losers. And that's where government needs to come in. That's where government, it seems to me, needs to come in, in terms of some training, in terms of tax policy, and in terms of, and maybe even in terms of using a little bit of a tariff here, a tariff there, or non-tariff non uh, policy measures too, just to make sure that the people with whom we're trading are playing fairly. Okay. Peter? Peter? So, yes, sir. You, you mentioned uh, the, the internet and, and how DARPA was yes. largely responsible for doing that. That's the Department of Defense. Right. But it, it strikes me that 
that the U.S. government almost treats business as religion, as something they don't get involved in. Yeah, well, I think that's true. Certainly, you know, the, your big lobby group there in Washington, the American Chamber of Commerce, those guys are really heavy hitters. They don't want any kind of regulation at all for the most part. But they aren't. But but the fact that they can access or somehow, if you will, appropriate the kinds of things that come from the public sector, where public money has been used for research and development and things like this, Space. Is, that, that's a good thing. I mean, I don't have I think that's a good thing. It, it, my only point is, is that the the, um, the the state does have a role to play in terms of providing that kind of input. And while they may be inefficient, you know, they they can afford to be for a while. In any case, and, until you know, until Congress gets a little annoyed, you know, if you're wasting money left and right. But they can provide. They can take risks, you know, and provide activities and research and development um, uh, um, activities, you know, in order to develop new stuff that smaller operators and private sector guys, you know, might not wish to, not, not uh, probably wouldn't be able to do. So let me conclude there. I, I, of course, have a bunch of notes here, none of which I mentioned except for Stiglitz, but I would say that, uh, I did want to mention the thing about Wheelo, the pump manufacturer. Oh, and Regalware, and just to give our local newspaper a little bit of a, a, a of a, um, a shout out. Th there was a small article there about the Regal family in Kewaskum. Uh fourth generation aluminum pots and stuff, right? That they I, I, they they make other things now, certainly. But you know, they've gone through four generations of the Regal family. R e i g l e. They make Regalware. R e g a l. Some of you may have some of that stuff in your homes and um, they're surviving for, because they've extended. I mean, they've reached out there and they have a big export operation. You know, they sell a lot overseas and they've adjusted and that's all part of the globalization thing too. And they, they don't have as many jobs up there as they used to certainly, but they, they do have a manufacturing sector and manufacturing is still the second it, here in Wisconsin. At, we're, there's Indiana and Wisconsin in terms of first and second place in the United States in terms of its manufacturing sector as a contributor to the overall state economy. So we still have a we still have a bunch of a bunch of um, guys making stuff, you know, as they used to. Certainly when I was growing up here, when John was growing up. Here. So happy to have a little bit of a discussion. I think I've bloviated for <laughs> certainly my certainly my uh, allotted time, John. No, you didn't. It was a wonderful presentation. Good, Peter. One, I'll start it off. Uh, it strikes me that that when you look at that curve, yeah, that that curve, yeah, that that begins to approximate the introduction of the information age, right. Right. And what, one of the things that strikes me is that the accumulation of wealth that goes with that information age, with the technologies involved, is part of, of the, is the conspicuous, its conspicuousness is part of the anti-globalization theme. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. It, it, and these things happen whenever we have these epical changes. Right, right. And you leave some behind and some sectors are left behind and some, you know, and, 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 you know, you have, so you have conflict, you have revolutions, you know, you have, you have, uh, I mean, the, the British and the, and the Germans started a fight, you know, basically, and this is terribly simplistic, you know, but before World War One, because they wished to dominate in terms of trade and, and Africa and the seas. And they weren't talking with each other. The fact that they happened to be related too, you know, and the royal families probably had something to do with it too, since they couldn't stand each other. But the 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 issue was those were the two big dogs on the block at the time. And they didn't want to, they weren't particularly interested in sharing power. One wished to predominate. And to say, and they at the time, given the amount of armaments both of them had, they didn't have to worry about anybody else getting in their way. But here, right, so I think I said this is this was like um, around 18, 
this is about 1820 right down here right down here is about 1820 so that's when you know, we began to transition that's when we began to that's the industrial that's, age right this is when you start to transition the industrial revolution starts with the mills in the 1700s in england but it really doesn't start to take off because um different uh you know sort of concomitant technological advances in communication and transportation start to hit here, start to hit around 1820 to 1840. And then, and then it's just, you know, it's like a rocket, right? But, and, and a lot of that wealth, of course, is concentrated in, at least initially, certainly in a few countries. All right, some questions, comments? Peter, one of the things that, that, that struck me is that this round of the globalization was largely, largely put together by us. Yes. And yeah. there are, were a number of countries who have risen to prominence today who were never part of that process and the establishment of the rules and how this is going to work. Yes. And again, to to go back to um, the, the two economists that I mentioned, L Lewis and Leontief, they saw this and they said, this, if we arrogate to ourselves this particular economic structure and these particular policy directives, we're gonna get hurt and we're gonna get hurt badly. And so they offered two different theories of economic development. And, and, and indeed, part of it was, we need to go a slightly different path because we, we can see that things will, are going to go uh, south on us internally in a lot of the countries that we happen to be working in. Uh, Leontief dealt a lot with, with Egypt and um, Arthur Lewis dealt a lot with Africa. He was a UN advisor at one point at the UN on economic uh, affairs to, um, to the powers that be. And he was always sort of saying, look, you know, you don't understand you're going to hurt a lot of the current economic structure and, and the, out, the uh, implications of that, certainly for not only the owners of production, but also the people who happen to support those things are, are going to be difficult. So, yeah, we certainly, with all of the money and talent and things that we have, where else is it going to go? And this whole trade regime uh, is something that, manifests and reflects the kind of output and technology and progress that we happen to be making here. Uh, it's interesting because um, our from 1990 until now, our, uh, our imports were um, in the in 1990, they were around 10 or 11% of our GDP. In, in 2018, they're about 15% of our overall GDP. So it's not as if they've really shot up, right? Where we've gotten all of that though, it's gone from something like, um, <clears throat> something like um, 30 trillion, I I'm sorry, sorry, 30 billion to 585 billion in imports just from China over that 30 year period. <clears throat> And that's been driven by our demand, by our ability to want those particular cheaper goods, right? Which has hollowed out our own manufacturing sectors. Right? Or they, they've moved offshore, they've gone to different places, right? Um, and that happens, that's, and that's a reflection of, of technology taking and robotics taking on a lot of those particular manufacturing processes that used to be done by, you know, by hand. My Peter, Peter there's a request online. that you show the original slide that defines globalization. Sure, sure. Happy to do it. Rachel, did you have a question in regard to that? As I say, this, this particular uh, link will be... Uh, it, it might drive you dizzy as it did me, but it 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 will nonetheless give you a good a good 
uh, optic on um, how nations all over the world have changed because of their engagement in, in, in a global system. So, I, I, you, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say just to just to, to keep us um, a, a little bit centered here, you know, but practical things, for instance, that um, there was something in Bloomberg News the other day saying that uh, whiskey, our whiskey exports, bourbon to the EU, EU are down by 37 percent in the past year and a half. <clears throat> costing whiskey distillers hundreds of millions in revenue between 2018 and 2020. Now, American whiskey exports to the UK, which is the whiskey industry's fourth largest market, have fallen by 53% since 2018, it said. Now, those are, those are just, <laughs> those are whiskey imports and exports, right, aren't all that particularly uh, valuable in the overall scheme of things. But they do appeal to a certain grouping, right, here in the U.S. Not everybody, relatively small grouping. And, but again, that's a particular slice of what happens when you put tariffs up, when people aren't talking to each other. And there are many, many more examples of these, certainly a lot more that are a bit more serious than whiskey imports or exports. But it is a reflection of what's happened over the past couple of years, right? without the WTO having much to say about it. Because as I say, we haven't had anybody there representing us. Susan, did you have a question? I saw your light, your, 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 uh, put your mic on. Ah, question from, uh, Doug Savage, can you talk a bit about the Trump administration's use of national security as a workaround to WTO rules? Yeah, I um, all I know, all I know about those kinds of things, Doug, is that if you have a, a federal law, uh, and and indeed, if there happens, if we're if we've signed on to a treaty or an international agreement. <clears throat> executive action can be taken and a determination can be made certainly by the president that in the interest of national security, and, and I'm hardly quoting here, but we can basically ignore the kinds of things that we had agreed to in previous discussions, or we can basically ignore what might otherwise be some legal implications, right? Because of the fact that we have determined that it is in the interest of our national security to forego adherence to what we had originally agreed to, all right? So, so and, and that's, that's actually, it's kind of a standard line, if I'm not mistaken, in a number of different pieces of legislation. And certainly it's in foreign aid, uh, which allows us, you know, to if we've given, you know, 100 million to dictator X, you know, and he turns out to be a really bad guy, uh, we can just, you know, turn on a dime, frankly, and stop everything right there. That's a good thing. No. Mr. Rukamora is gonna test you. Yes. He says, the law of comparative advantage may fail us if it results in societal damage. And showing that he has some economic insights. On the other hand, as all economists will say, yeah. the absence of globalization may also result in, in social and international upheaval. That is the Great Depression, World War, et cetera, et cetera. So somehow it seems we need to find a middle way. Peter, your challenge right now is what is the middle way? Yeah, what is the middle way, right? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would agree. I mean, I appreciate that observation by Rick. I, uh, the, the closest I've heard to anything in that regard, John, was an article that you had mentioned earlier and that we talked about only briefly by Jessica Matthews in the Foreign Affairs section or the Foreign Affairs uh, magazine of this past March, where she talks about. Uh, uh, present at the recreation, right? I think she calls it yes. present at the recreation where she sees the fact that, um, you know, our allies want to remain engaged with us, but they're a little bit cherry of doing so because of the fact that they felt that we had over the past four years treated them somewhat capriciously and we had acted in unpredictable ways. And that 
we're not averse to basically turning around and, and, and saying, well, we're not your friend anymore. So she, on, on the one hand, there's a, a group in Washington that w wants to remain engaged, but also wants to remain engaged in terms of our ability to fix things, to fix nations, and to do so from a military standpoint, right? For, from my own perspective, fortunately, I think that's diminishing a bit now, right? I think that's a good thing. And then there's another group that doesn't want to have anything to do with that kind of military adventurism, but does want to remain militarily engaged and does want to talk still at least from uh, a bit about, about human rights and things like this. Globalization like human rights, I think, happen to be embedded in our, in our foreign policy structure now. It's, it's, certainly taken, it's in our DNA. It's, it, yeah, and, and you can't have, a, as, as I was, I think, thing a couple of months ago to somebody, you can't have a, a real politic sort of strategy for in international relations without having a little bit of idealism. Indeed, having a real politic strategy isn't realistic if you don't have a little bit of idealism as reflected in sort of a human rights, in a human rights position, you know, how Peter, that, you know. Peter, uh, what also Matthews noted was that within both political parties, there is a significant se a segment of, of those parties that is anti-globalization. And yes. this tempers either party's approach to, to supporting globalization uh, and, and brings the attention of whichever party is in power more domestically oriented. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, certainly I would have, yeah. And, and certainly I, I think you, you need it here now, uh, uh, much more attention to, to domestic issues. And, um, you know, we've, the disasters of, the, of, you know, of Iraq and Afghanistan and, and these these foreign adventures, the forever wars, as Dex, Dexter Filkins called them, you know, about 15 years ago, are just are 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 corrosive. And um, unfortunately, I think you know there th there's no neat, clean, interesting way for us to be able to get out of those things. And you know, I said earlier that nations want us to be involved even though they happen to find us a little bit annoying, but it's convenient in many regards that we happen to be there. I think it's convenient as far as the Iranians are concerned that we happen to be in Afghanistan. The Iranians hate the Afghanis, you know, as long as we can, and they've never gotten along with the Afghanis. And as long as we happen to be there taking care of the Afghanis, taking care of the fundamentalist Afghanis, the Iranians probably have a little less to worry about. Right. But, but this, this stuff here, you know, if, if you look at this, <clears throat> th these are the big issues over the next 15 to 20 years. And they're not going to be resolved, but that we maintain some type of regular international engagement. That's the position that I would take on that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nihist, I guess. John. Well, and, and, and your, as a, your as a last Joseph. point there on climate change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we're seeing in 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 Africa and what we're seeing in Central America is that changing climate conditions is generating migrations. Yeah, yeah. and this is going to affect uh, the the well being of of nation states. Germany taking on a million new. Citizens, I'm not sure. It's not, I guess it's not citizens, but a new an, an obligation of dealing with a, a million new souls. Yeah, yeah, uh, is uh, is going to change Germany rather significantly. I would. Yes. Think. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, and and my response would be to that, not and not to be flip about this, but and it's how I feel about immigration to the United States. I say, okay, so we're going to change a little bit here. I guess our, our, I don't think inherently our national character is going to change because I, uh, you know, America is an idea. Citizenship is an idea. I don't care what you look like or how you think, you know, if you adhere to a certain core set of values, you're, you're an American and you get your citizenship, right? And I would say the same. I think the Europeans probably have a little bit tougher time with that, certainly. I'm sure they do. Uh, 
to to bring in people you know who aren't necessarily you know of their culture or their ethnic background and things like this it's not just the germans the spaniards where i s- spent some time you know are, are very much like this too the brits for goodness sake although the brits don't have much to complain about you know i mean they gave everybody from their colonies a commonwealth passport so you can basically fly into london and then and you're there you don't have to right <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that's changed a bit now, but certainly in the 60s and 70s, that's what you could do. Unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Well, Peter, it's it's not a particularly wonderful picture, <laughs> but it's a real picture. And you gave us lots of different ideas and different ways to look at that information. And we thank you. Always a pleasure, John. Thanks so much. I'm good. Happy to do this. The sound of one set of hands clapping. And, and, and thank you to the Cedarburg Library once again for putting this on. Well, and to the Cedarburg Friends of the Library who funded this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you.